Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvasesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavanda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Something wrong here. I'm not getting my PowerPoint. Mm. One minute. But Prabhu, I have to share the screen. Recording in progress. Prabhu? Haribo? What? I need to share the screen. Somebody has to... Who's, in, who's coordinating? Marat, you are co-host now. Oh, thank you. Okay, let's see. Lesson three. First of all, review. Okay, what incident between Diti and Kashapa teaches us about Krishna conscious Grihastha life? What the incident between Diti and Kashapa taught us about Krishna conscious Grihastha life? Anybody like to answer this question? That uh, Diti uh, approached uh, Kasyapa for uh, um, inauspicious time. Uh, for... Yes? What? Did it teach you anything? It's to be carefully dealt with. As you had said, that going to office without, without eating. Just going to a feast. Okay. Going to a feast, not the office, going to a feast. Oh, right, yeah. So, thank you, Maharaj. So, it is to be very carefully dealt with and most particularly, everything is available in Grihastha Ashram and we should ensure that at least under any circumstances, there should not be any misutilization to secure a successful devotional life, to secure pure devotional uh, life. And um, Diti, uh, uh, under the influence of sexual desire, prompted uh, husband Kashyap for sexual intercourse in an auspicious time. And that should be very carefully avoided because if, uh, and his uh, sexual life should be should be executed under uh, seeking instruction from the spiritual master and in order to in order to uh, extend progeny population for the purpose of uh, for the purpose of greater purpose of making krishna conscious children so that should be ensured during this life all right yes we want good progeny we want good children and we get good children when you do it the proper way right There's, we're not against sex Krishna says, Lord Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that he himself becomes sex life, which is not against religious principles. 
So there's nothing wrong with sex life. It's very uh, use, it's very important to produce good, good Krishna conscious children. Okay, so but it has to be carefully controlled. That's the point. And then you'll get good children. All right, then secondly, husband and wife can cooperate for spiritual advancement. How can husband and wife cooperate for spiritual advancement? Who would like to answer this? Let's hear a Mataji. The Mataji will say, yes, husband should listen to me. We discussed this yesterday. Yeah, I want you to tell me what we, what was the conclusion. Yes, the, um, please accept my humble obeisances, Maharaj. Yes, so husband should also be understanding that uh, uh, when the wife, in this case, as we are seeing, that she is also interested to have kids of her own, children of her own. Um, that everyone is, all of our sisters are also having, co-wives of Kashya Pramuni is also having children. So the husband should be considerate and understanding that uh, a wife should be given um, uh, uh, children because without children, household is empty, as we discussed yesterday. And uh, also, um, to control the senses, husband and wife both should be control each other's senses and when someone is getting carried away by the sense uh, requirement, the other person should be able to control the right. opposite person. How, how did Prabhupada describe it? What's the qualification for the husband? Qualification of the husband is... Uh, what does he have to undergo before he becomes can make a good husband? Oh, good he has to uh, uh, He has to practice brahmacharya life. Right. And he wife has, to, has to be chast, chast, uh, chastity. Wife has to practice chastity. She practice should be chastity. chaste. Wife chastity. should be chaste. If she if if she's not chaste, then there will be a big problem in married life, and the husband. He should be trained in brahmachari life. What's the importance of brahmachari life? What's the training? That they will control their senses. Right. Okay. So these are good qualifications. All right, and then what about the role of Lord Shiva? Let's hear someone else answer. What was the role of Lord Shiva? Kel Meaning, uh, if someone who is not following the regulated, like uh, the proper process, so it mainly it's so it's like uh, if something is not happening to uh, like spirits. You haven't got it right. Can I try, Maharaj? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Lord Shiva is the controller of the mode of ignorance and he's a compassionate person so uh, as apurvani lachalishwari mother you are saying that uh, if some regulative principles are broken i mean like in this case uh, they uh, had sex in they are uh, given body they are forced in the womb of uh, that mother no, no, I don't know where you get all this from. It's not quite right. It's, this is not... Who gets... He gets angry. He who, gets angry. Get this straight, first of all. Who gets placed in the womb of people who have sex? At the demons. The demons and the demonic people. Is it the demons? Or who else is... Ghosts. The ghosts, those people who don't have a physical body, Lord Shiva takes compassion on them and he places them in the womb of people, of women who are having sex at the inauspicious time. 
and, and that way they will get a physical body. That is what he does. And that doesn't mean they're going to become Krishna conscious. But they, they do get a physical body. They may become Krishna conscious. They may be lucky, but it's not, it may not. A lot of them won't. Because they're placed into inauspicious situations, nasty situations. For example, unmarried women, so many unmarried mothers. The ch child has only a mother, no father, like that. So, look. But Maharaj, we discussed this, uh, I mean, you were saying this yesterday, that out of compassion, uh, Lord Shiva is doing so that they get another chance in their life, so they can become Krishna conscious. They get a physical body. Not that they get Krishna consciousness. It does, I don't... Not Krishna. No, not Krishna consciousness, but they get a chance if but they want. They get a physical body. That's the chance they get. They get the physical body. Okay. Because they were ghosts. So Lord Shiva shows compassion on the ghosts. Okay. Got it, Lord. Then there, there's ghosts, there's two types of suicide mentioned. Right? Yes, yes, Maharaj. Explain, yes, to, ex explain to me, what are the two types of suicide? One suicide is the physical suicide, uh, when a person ends his material body. What will happen to him? They will become ghost. Yes. And? and? Another one is the spiritual suicide, when the, when the impersonalist desire to merge into the Brahman, uh, or he want to become Shiva, <laughs> yeah, so, so why is it compared to suicide? Then his spiritual life is finished, he cannot have any relation with Krishna, he cannot enjoy, he will just not get any pleasure there. Yes, right. They're losing their, they want to lose their identity, right? Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay. So, Lord Shiva is kind on these ghost people. Lord Shiva's ideal example, ideal example, yes, what is his example? What's he doing that's ideal? It's a renunciation. Renunciation. He's not attached to, to what? Material comfort. Material pleasure. Material pleasure. Why? How does he, how do, how do you know that? What's he doing? Because he thinks that, yes, Maharaj, he feels that all the material pleasures are for Krishna. <laughs> no, 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 I, I don't. No. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he uses all the material things to serve Krishna, but he himself stays in crematorium and doesn't even uh, build a house for himself. Yes, where does he stay? In the crematorium. Or? Crematorium. Where did he stay with, with his wife, usually? Himalayas, Kailash. Kailash, under the tree. Under a tree, right. What kind of tree? Bhattabhukya, or uh, Asutta, Bhattabhukya. Banyan tree, Banyan tree. Banyan, Banyan tree. tree, thank you, yeah. yes, Banyan tree, right. Yes, he's detached, and he's... What about clothing? He's, preg he's naked and his body is covered in ashes. So he, he's detached from material uh, enjoyment. He has no interest in material enjoyment. So that's, uh, that's the example. Uh, and, and of course he, he shows compassion on the fallen souls. Uh, the, the ghosts, he tries to help them. And then there were positive and negative aspects of Titi's action. What was the positive aspects? He rep she repented. Yes, uh, repentance. For her action. Yes. And, and uh, that is, yeah, that's, that's what. That's one. 
There was some unflinching faith. Unflinching faith in who? Supreme Personality. Only? And also for her husband. Faith in her husband? Yes. And also uh, adoration for Lord Shiva. Yes, adoration for Lord Shiva. Okay. Good. And what about the neg what were the negative aspects of Diti's action? She asked for a uh, um, union at an inauspicious time. She could not control her senses. She couldn't she control her senses, down. act against the regulated principles, yes. Anything else? She thought that uh, the regards are not sure absolutely. She what? Absolutely. She neglected that uh, the regards and not sure were there to observe the time. She, yes, she, she neglected. The, the, to, she, to, she, she became jealous of uh, not having a child like other wives. She became what? Jealous. Jealous. Jealous? Well, I don't think that was mentioned as one of the negative aspects. That wasn't actually mentioned, although you could say that, but you have to, we want to know what's actually said in the book. What are the points which are mentioned there in the Bhagavatam? Okay, and then we spoke about the qualities of Prahlad Maharaj. Do you remember any of the qualities of Prahlad Maharaj? One quality? Strong faith in the uh, Supreme Personality of Godhead. Uh, yes. okay. And he is happy when other, others are happy. And he is distressed when others are distressed. Yes, good, that's right, that's one. Yes, anything else? He doesn't know anything beyond the Supreme God like that. He, you know, uh, he, he knows Supreme God's not about it. He what? He was. Uh, Fully known as uh, Supreme Personality of Godhead, and nothing beyond uh, one of the translations it is mentioned. He, he sees the Supreme Lord. Um, he sees the Lord in where? Uh, in all places. Right. Everywhere. He sees the Lord in all living entities, right. Okay. And of course, Prahlad is going to be born as the son. One of one child of Diti, oh, oh, grandchild, the grandchild, right? Not the actual child of Diti, but the grandson of Diti. Okay, we'll go ahead to chapter fifteen. We'll re we're going to review the first twenty-six verses. There's two sections. First of all, the chapter begins with while well, Diti is pregnant. She keeps the embryo in her womb for 100 years. That's quite a tapasya to do. Women have to suffer that. That's, that's actually suffering, a lot of suffering. For 100 years she did it. You can see her amazing qualities that she tolerated so much to keep the child in her womb for 100 years. And then the demoniac influence of sons in the womb expands darkness throughout the universe. The demigods approach Brahma for an explanation. All right, let's go through the chapter verse by verse. Someone can read the first verse, translation. Go ahead. My dear Vidra, Diti, the wife of the sage Kashyapa, could understand that the sons within her womb would be a cause of disturbance to the demigods, 
As such, she continuously bore the powerful sin of pressure for him, which was meant to be troubled to others for 100 years. Right. So she's willing to undergo that tapasya because she knew these children are going to give trouble to others. Right? What kind of people are going to be troubled by these children? All the demigods, women. Yes, right. The demigods, the devotees, the women. Right. All right, someone read number two. And by, by the, the force, force of, uh, okay, Prabhuji, carry on. By the, force of the, by the force of the pregnancy of Diti, the light of the sun and moon was impaired in all the planets. And the demigods of various planets, being disturbed by, the, by that force, asked the creator of the universe, Brahma, what is this expansion of darkness in all directions? <laughs> okay. So demigods are puzzled by the darkness. They want to know. They ask Lord Brahma. Yes, go on. Text number the three. Fortunate uh, text number three, the fortunate demigod said, O great one, just see this darkness which you know very well and which is causing us anxieties. Because the influence of time cannot touch you, there is nothing unmanifest before you. Okay, influence of time cannot touch who? Who are, the, who are, the, who are demigods speaking to? Brahma, Lord Brahma. Yes. Mm. So Brahma is addressed as here Prabhupada explains in the purport, Brahma is addressed as Vibhu and as the personality of Godhead. He is the Supreme Personality of Godhead's incarnation of the mode of passion in the material world. He is non-different in the representative sense from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And therefore, the influence of time cannot affect him. So it's a very interesting point, important point. But Maharaj Brahma has death. He yes, has Brahma has death, you're right, yes. But actually it's not, it's not death like what we experience, but he has to give up the body. He will change the body. It's, it, it's not like the death which we undergo. He's, he's on a much higher level. He's at the top of the universe at Satya Loka. And he has a very long life. His body is subtle. And uh, what happens at, at the end of the life of Brahma, and we say, talk about the end of the life of Brahma, he'll give up that body and either he will enter Either he will go back to Godhead, into the spiritual world, or he will enter into Mahavishnu and he may have to take birth again. It depends if he is a pure devotee or not. If he's pure devotee, he'll go back to Godhead at the end of his life. And if he's not, he'll enter into Mahavishnu and take birth again. Lord Maharaj, this is, this is a new understanding, obviously you had studied that time has no influence upon the Supreme Personality of God Lord Krishna, it only witnesses the past times rendered by Krishna in the spiritual world. And time has influenced the material planet, in the material world. But now accepting that uh, uh, Brahma is the incarnation of Supreme Personality of Godhead, we are saying that time has no influence upon Brahma. Well, it's, it's saying he's a, a representative of the incarnation. But he's a representative of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He's in, he's in charge of the mode of passion. So he's a guna avatar. Right? He's known, they're, it's known as guna avatar. He's in charge of the mode of passion. Not that he is in the mode of passion, but he's in control of that mode of passion. And that's one of the, his services. But it, just a minute. The influence, Prabhupada mentions the influences of time 
which manifests as past, present and future cannot touch higher personalities like Brahma and other demigods. The influence of time like past, present and future. That is very much on the material platform. So Brahma is on very high level. He's a very elevated devotee. Adikavaya, he's Adikavaya, right? He's a very learned soul. And he's given the responsibility to do the work of creation. And he's in charge of the mode of passion. So, the, the, the effect of time doesn't influence him the way it influences us. Our bodies are very much influenced by time. We can feel, we can see the decay of our body, how it grows old. But Brahma doesn't suffer like that. His body is on a different level. I said it's very subtle, his body. But still, you know, he, he, he is empowered by the, by the grace of Krishna to do that wonderful service. And because he's doing that service, he's not really affected by time. He doesn't, it doesn't decay his body. You have to understand, as you go higher in the universe, then the effects of the modes of nature lessen. Brahma is situated way up at the top of the universe, there's not so much passion and ignorance there. Brahma's not in passion. Brahma is in charge of the mode of passion. So Maharaj, Brahma does not undergo old age? Well, he doesn't have a body like what we have. Uh, but in pictures, uh, it shows that uh, Brahma is also, uh, Brahma's pictures, many pictures, it, sh it shows that he's old. <laughs> yeah. Is it not correct? Is it not correct? Well, uh, yeah, we have to understand. Is he old? Brahma just now is about 50 years old. About half of his life has passed. So, he lives a hundred years. So is he old? When you're 50, are you old? Will you look old? Huh? No. <laughs> 50 is not old. <laughs> well, when I was 20, I thought 50 was old, but not right now. Uh, but, uh, but still, I mean, doesn't he get white beard? Because in the pictures, it shows like that. Yeah, they may show like that. Just the... Uh, you know, these are artists' impressions where they want to remind us that Brahma is the original person in the first living entity in the universe. And so we imagine him like this, these different ways. But here's a different way to understand it. That he's a, he's a guna avatar and he's an elevated personality and he's not so much influenced by time. It's not, it's not going to be, he's not going, his body's not going to be deteriorating the way our body. And you have to understand on the higher planets, there's no, there's no disease. You know, it, 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 it's not like we are, you know, our planet here, this is a planet of death. But Brahma's planet is... Although, although we talk about highest planet to the lowest, all the places of birth and death, but it's a little different. The death which Brahma undergoes is a, quite different from the death we undergo. Brahma is like, it, it's, you know, actually all we're doing is changing the body. And one who is on the transcendental platform, he's not so much influenced by the effects of time. We see Lord, when Lord Krishna comes in this world, of course, Lord Krishna is not affected by time. Maharaj, sometimes uh, when uh, an eligible person is not available for the post of Brahma, the Lord himself becomes Brahma. Yes, right. Uh, so in, in that case, uh, there is no impact of time on that, on, on that Brahma. 
Mm, yes, on that Brahma there's no influence of time. Not every time that the Lord has to become Brahma, but sometimes it happens. Sometimes, yes, Maharaj. Mm, okay. But Maharaj, as Prabhuji is saying that when Lord takes the role of Brahma, time has no influence by that time particularly. And uh, time has influence on Brahma when he himself takes the role. Is it correct? I don't quite understand what you're saying. Uh, as Prabhuji said that uh, when Lord appears in form of Brahma, uh, to, in, the, in the post of Brahma, then time, ha time has no influence. But uh, when Brahma himself... Well, didn't Prabhupada him didn't, didn't qualify it like that. Okay. Prabhupada just simply said Brahma. It's mentioned here, it just says Brahma. It doesn't say when the Lord becomes Brahma, it happens like that. But it's certainly more easier to understand that when the Lord becomes Brahma, in time wants him. But here it simply mentions Brahma. And he mentions even uh, and other demigods. It says, cannot touch higher personalities like Brahma and other demigods. Right? Because they're engaged in some service for the Lord. So, they're active in, the, in devotion and in, in some service. They're not pure devotees, but they could become pure devotees. They're elevated, they're very dear to the Lord. Their bodies are more subtle. They're not so much influenced by time that their bodies don't deteriorate the way our bodies deteriorate. This is something we have to understand, you have to appreciate. Let's go ahead, text number four. Read. O oh God of the demigods, sustainer of the universe, air, jewel of all the demigods and other planets, you know the intentions of all living entities in both the spiritual and material worlds. Okay. Purport. Because Brahma is almost on an equal footing with the personality of Godhead, he is addressed here as the God of the demigods. And because he is the secondary creator of this universe, he is addressed as the sustainer of the universe. He is the head of all the demigods, therefore he is addressed here as the head jewel of the of the demigods. It is not difficult for him to understand everything which is happening in both the spiritual and material worlds. He knows everyone's heart and everyone's intentions. Therefore he was requested to explain this incident. Why was the pregnancy of Diti causing such anxieties all over the universe. Just like when Mother Bhumi was troubled with all the demonic kings on her planet, then she went to Lord Brahma. And then Lord Brahma meditated on Vishnu, Shiradakashai Vishnu. So Lord Brahma is really a, at the head, he's the head of the universe. So it's almost God. Go ahead. O oh Lord, all these planets exist within yourself, and all the living entities are generated from you. Therefore, no, you didn't, you Mataji, you didn't read the earlier one. This text five. Thank you, Mataji, for pointing this out. I was wondering what she was doing. Okay, thank you, Mataji. O original source of strength and scientific knowledge, all obeisances unto you. You have accepted the differentiated mode of passion from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. With the help of external energy, you are born of the unmanifested source, all obeisances unto you. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing the demigods offer their prayers to Brahma. 
The Vedas are the original scientific knowledge for all departments of understanding, and this knowledge of the Vedas was first impregnated into the heart of Brahma by the personality of Godhead. Therefore, Brahma is the original source of all scientific knowledge. He is born directly from the transcendental body of Garbhodakshai Vishnu, who is never seen by any creature of this material universe and therefore always remains unmanifested. Brahma is stated here to be born of the unmanifested. He is the incarnation of the mode of passion in material nature, which is the separated external energy of the Supreme Lord. And so there Prabhupada said he's the incarnation of the mode of passion. <laughs> because he has to do the work of creation. But he's overseeing that mode of passion. Go ahead, text number six. O Lord, all these planets exist within the universe, and all the living entities are generated from you. Therefore, you are the cause of this universe, and anyone who meditates upon you without temptation against devotional service. Mm. Okay, there's no purple. We'll go ahead. Text number seven. Someone read. There is no defeat in this material world for persons who control the mind and senses by controlling the breathing process and who are therefore experienced mature mystics. This is because by such perfection in yoga they have attained your mercy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Prabhupada talks about the purpose of yoga to control the mind and senses. Anyone who has control. Hmm. So Prabhupada said, if you're, if you're a Krishna conscious devotee, then you're the best yogi. You should have control of your mind and senses. Devotees, devotees are not defeated anywhere in the universe. And Prabhupada quotes a verse, Narayana Parasarvi Nakutas Chanya Vibhyate. Okay, go ahead, text number eight. Yes, who hasn't read? All the, all the living entities within the universe are conducted by the Vedic directions as a... Directions as a bull is directed by the rope attached to its horns. No one can violate the rules laid down in the Vedic literatures. To the chief person who has contributed the Vedas, we offer our respect. Okay. To the chief person who has contributed the Vedas. Who is that? Brahma. Lord Brahma. Where did Lord Brahma get the Vedas from? From the spiritual side of Godhead. Right. Tene Brahma Redai Adekavayi. Right. The Lord imparted the Vedic knowledge into the heart of Brahma. Maharaj, I have one doubt. Yes. Uh, in earlier translation, it was said that whoever meditates upon Brahma attains devotional service. And in one of the purpose, Prabhupada is writing that Brahma knows everything in the, of the spiritual and material worlds. Maharaj, uh, only if Brahma is a devotee, then only he may know about spiritual world. Other Brahma may not, cannot know about spiritual world. Is that not correct, Maharaj? No, other Brahmas can also know about the spiritual world. Why not? It's true for all Brahmas. They can know about the material world. They can also know about the spiritual world. Because they're, they're at the top of the universe. So they're close. They're close to the spiritual world. Yes, Maharaj. In, in one of the purports, I, I think by Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he has written that Brahma can be a Jnani Brahma and a devotee Brahma. Oh, okay. 
some brahmas, not pure devotees. But we, in this universe, at least in this universe, we heard how Brahma shook hands with the Lord. So he was a pure devotee. He's a pure devotee in this universe. And he's in Sakyaras. Because he, the Lord shook hands with him. When, Maharaj? Well, you've read the second canto, haven't you? I have read, Maharaj. Huh? Yes, Maharaj, I, I read it. So you Lord should... Shook hand. I didn't remember that Lord shook hand with the Sorry. Okay. So, the subject is about sense control, following the rules and regulations of the Vedas. Text number nine, the demigods prayed to Brahma, Please look, please look upon us mercifully, for we have fallen into a miserable condition because of the darkness. All our work has been suspended. What was the cause of the darkness? Because of, yes, because of the pregnancy of Diti. Yes. Prabhupada talks about the North and South Pole. Sometimes there's no, you know, they have sometimes no light and sometimes no, no, no darkness. So, no, they have tw sometimes 24 hours sunlight and sometimes 24 hours darkness. <clears throat> that Maharaj, uh, did he uh, was steered for 100 years or he, she kept in the womb? Uh, she kept in the womb for 100 years. She kept that, is Maharaj, that is Maharaj, unlike our, the, our pregnancy in the present context, nine months only, embryo is... Well, you have to understand she's a resident of the higher planets. Text number 10 is fuel overloads a fire, so the embryo created by the simon of Kashyap in the womb of Diti has caused complete darkness throughout the universe. The darkness throughout the universe is explained as being caused by the embryo created in the womb of Diti by the simon of Kashyap. And then text 10, Maitreya said, the Lord, Thus Lord Brahma, who is understood by transcendental vibration, tried to satisfy the demigods, being pleased with their words of prayer. Brahma could understand the mysteries of Diti, and therefore he smiled at the whole situation. He replied to the demigods present there in words they could understand. You can understand the superior position of Lord Brahma, over the other demigods. He's going to instruct them. All right, text 12. Lord Brahma Maharaj, says, yes? I have a question. So, uh, because Lord Brahma and the demigods, it mentioned in, uh, in the other purport that they are Trikal Darshi, they can see the present, past and future. So, don't they, and also in every, um, every universe, this incident takes place that they may not be Jai Vijay, but um, Hiranyakashipu and their born and all these pastimes are always uh, taking place. So why are they always surprised and why are they always, you know, why do they act as if it is unknown to them? They should be knowing they are elevated souls, right? So why is it surprise for them? Well, there are many things which we know, but they surprise us. You know, just like we know everybody's going to die, but when somebody dies, it's still a surprise. We know there's many troubles in this world. So when things happen, it's, it, it is a shock, and it is a surprise, even, when, even for elevated personalities. 
But you could say it's all Leela, just like Arjuna. You know, why did Arjuna have to have Krishna say it, speak the Bhagavad Gita? He'd already heard it so many times before. Krishna said many, many times, I've spoken this to you. Arjuna wanted to hear it again. So for the purpose of pastimes, Leela. Okay, Lord Brahma said, <clears throat> My four sons, four Kumaras, who were born from my mind are your predecessors. Sometimes they travel throughout the material and spiritual skies without any definite desire. Are the four Kumaras affected by time? Yes. Huh? Yes, Maharaj. They are? Acceptable time. Do you see them becoming old? No. They're always like child. Yeah, they're not affected by time. They keep their little child's bodies, they're little, like little children. Although they're the oldest in the universe, the first sons of Brahma, they're not affected by time. They were born from the mind of Brahma. And sometimes they go into the spiritual sky. Does it apply to Narad? Yes. So Prabhupada talks about desire in the purport. The four Kumaras have no material desires. Sometimes they travel all over the universe just to preach devotional service. Text 13, after this traveling all over the universe, they also entered into the spiritual sky, where they were freed from all material contamination. In the spiritual sky, there are spiritual planets known as Vaikuntas, which are the residents of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and its pure devotees and are worshipped by the residents of all the material planets. Okay, let's look at this PowerPoint here. Brahma explains to his sons, the four Kumaras, he explains, no, he explains how they entered into Vaikuntha, right? So, we want you to tell us about Vaikuntha. How many people are here today? 15, Maharaj. Excuse me, Maharaj. 15, Prabhu. Okay, we'll make three groups of five. Three groups of five people. We want you to take uh, the first group, take verses 13 to 17. Group 2, verses 18 to 22. And group 3, verses 23 to 28. And tell us about the features of the Vaikuntha planets. Okay? We'll give you... We'll how, give, how long they will take? Well, how, time? seven minutes. Maximum seven, shouldn't take more than ten minutes. Okay? What's your problem? Oh, come on. Stop wasting my time you. What do you want? Uh -huh. What do you want? No, at daytime, Padmapa Prabhu came here to meet you. Oh. So you are not there. Recording stopped. 18th March on Guru Purnima Day. Oh. Which? Uh, Prabhuji, which? Uh, for room 3, which one? Which verse to which verse? 23 to 28. Okay, thank you. What time? time I'm I've got other classes. You have to tell me what time, I'll tell you if I can do it or not. Yes, ma'am, yes. yes. Thank you. Anand Krishna Prabhu, you need to join some room.
Maharaj, do you wish to join some group? Uh, okay. You can join to room number two. Also, they are conscious of Tulsi. That is mentioned. Because Tulsi is getting special preference by the Lord. Yes, they're doing good. Okay, Maharaj. You're not joining any room yourself? You're not going in a room? No, Maharaj. I have to see the back, background, sir. Okay. Okay, how long have they had? Hmm? They had three, four minutes more, Maharaj. Oh, okay. Give them three, four minutes more, yeah. There's only 15 here tonight? Yes, Maharaj. How many are supposed to be in the course? 20. Five don't come. <laughs> but actually, uh, two devotees are joining from one uh, ID. Oh. Uh, and can I, um, this one Prabhu is busy with Mayapur on the uh, Gorpurnima festival. And some uh, one different devotee health is not good. They have legal reasons. <laughs> Okay. Most of the devotees are sincere in this batch. Yeah, I think so. I think I think the participation is quite sincere, quite genuine. We come from many different places.
ओके टू मिनट महाराज All right. Who is a spokesman for group number one? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, we had not we had not decided. Anyone can be? Yeah. Or someone. Can I speak or uh, yeah, go ahead. Krishna? Go ahead and speak. Okay, Prabhuji, Baikun to planets are free from all material anxieties and chaos and also metal contaminations. They relentlessly worship the Lord, constantly and continuously enjoying the blissful uh, and the pleasurable moments of, of the, the association with the Lord. And in the next verses, the forms are four-handed, like the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and they form, they are in the pure mode of goodness without any tinge of passion or ignorance in any form. And these have been evidenced from Sabda Brahma, which is the best evidence to accept and believe these informations. And personality is maintained, which is very, very significant, refuting the conception of impersonalists. They say there is no personal conception of the Lord, and they are free to travel to any place, to any planet, without any restrictions and prohibitions. By glorifying the transcendental glories of the Lord, on on unstoppably and uh, without any without an interruption, and they all are free from sense gratification. Even they are. They are so transcendentally situated uh, in a blissful atmosphere. They would uh, they would avoid the fragrance of uh, beautiful flowers. That is the nature of the Boykundu planets. Very enjoyable and blissful planet. Okay, this much, Maharaj. Thank you. Would someone else like to add some more? Some points you didn't mention. Another point is that uh, although the inhabitants of Vaikuntha planet are similar to that of Lord Narayana, but uh, there is a difference. That Lord Narayana is having a Shiva Satchinna, but uh, others are not having that. Sorry? Uh, Lord Narayana is having a um, um, emblem of, uh, that uh, mark that is called Shiva uh -huh. That is the, the left chest of the Lord, but in others' uh, case, uh, that is not there. That is the difference between the Lord and the inhabitants of the Baikon planets. Yes. Okay, tell me some more about Vaikuntha. From this section 13 to 17, there are more descriptions. You didn't cover everything. Uh, 
uh, another point is that uh, uh, the um, ladies they are very um, beautiful and uh, he, uh, he, i mean males are very um, uh, having so much strength but they are not attracted by each other because uh, they are so much attracted by the lord that the ladies cannot uh, attract the um, gents like that uh -huh. yes anything more <laughs> in, in Vakunta planet, there are uh, many forests. Ah. They are all like uh, very auspicious, and uh, they are all desired in Kalpa Vrikshas. And they are uh, they are always filled with fruits and flowers, and everything is used in Krishna service. And every every uh, everyone is uh, like having a personal form, and they are uh, like uh, all fully spiritual. Yes, what kind of trees are they? Kalpavraksha, like desire trees. So can you tell me more? What kind Please, of uh, what, what kind of fruit do we get? Um, anything like we, we, we require we can uh, they produce for the service of the Lord. Whatever we want we can get. We are based on the desire. Okay. Can we get strawberries from a from a tree? We can get yes, yes, Maharaj. We can get. <laughs> Usually, strawberries grow on the ground, right? Or I don't know if you could get them on the, off the tree. What about in Vaikuntha? How do they travel? Can you tell me how they travel? By aeroplanes. Oh. What did, did they have uh, air in, in, indigo there? Air indigo there? <laughs> <laughs> that is that is Vaikuntha. <laughs> company is Vaikuntha company. <laughs> mm. So we travel. We can go anywhere. By that uh, planes, airplanes. Yeah. Who do they go with? Who goes in the airplanes? Who travels with them? With their wives. Ah, yes, with their wives. And what are they doing? They are engaged in singing the um, glories of the Lord. Yes, they're always singing the glories of the Lord. And do they, do they, are they attracted by the beautiful Madhavi flowers? They have said that. Uh, what do they think of these Madhavi flowers? The Madhavi uh, flowers are very fragrant and they're full of honey. Yes. yes. They the derived even, the, 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 even the presence of uh, these uh, Madhavi flowers. Yes. How do they get the, where do they get the aroma of these flowers? There, there's a breeze, right? There's a breeze. Yes, breeze. Yes, 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 Maharaj. The breeze is carrying the fragrance of these flowers. Flowers, yes, Maharaj. And it's very nice, it's very pleasing. <laughs> And, it, and the breeze also carries the honey of the flowers. But the inhabitants of Vaikuntha, what do they think? What's their feelings? They give, they give more preference to the service of the Lord rather than and, uh, doing their sense gratification. Yes, they're more interested in glorifying the Lord. They don't like the disturbance of such a nice breeze while they are chanting the Lord's glories. Meaning, they are pure devotees and they think to worship the Lord is more important than their own sense gratification. So that is the nature of Vaikuntha. They, they take more care, they think more about glorifying the Lord. All right, group two, text 18 to 22, tell us. What's happening? Who's the spokesman, group two? 
first branch like this team. I want to show PowerPoint for group two. You have a PowerPoint? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Let's see it. Co co-host Samita Ji, I think you should yes, be able yes, to see Yes, yes. Yes, where's your PowerPoint? So, uh, the text uh, 18 to 22, it first tells us about the uh, description of Vaikuntha and the birds. So, even in Vaikuntha, even the birds are also Krishna conscious. They are, uh, they even though the birds have a sweet voice, but still they stop their voices just to hear the glories of the Lord sung by the bees. So, uh, in the material world, we see that even uh, donkeys think that their voice is sweet, but in the spiritual world, even if the bird's voice is sweet, they stop their voice to hear the glories of the Lord. And uh, in Vaikuntha, the next verse describes about the flowering plants. So, there are so many different varieties of flowering plants, the names are given, but still, even though they are full of transcendental fragrance, but still all of them respect the austerities. They are conscious of the austerities performed by Tulsi because Tulsi is preferred uh, to when uh, to offer the Lord, uh, the Lord wears garlands made of Tulsi leaves. So all the flowering plants, they give respect to Tulsi Maharani. And then uh, there is a description of the airplanes. The airplanes are made of gems. Uh, uh, like uh, emerald, gold, so many different gems. It shows that the, it is not poverty stricken. So even the airplanes are decorated with so many gems. And in Vaikuntha, uh, the pleasure is so much that there is no need of sex pleasure. So the, that uh, there is transcendental pleasure in Vaikuntha. And uh, there is also description of the uh, ladies in Vaikuntha planets. All of them are as beautiful as the goddess of fortune herself. But still, they are always engaged in dusting the marble walls in Vaikuntha so that they get the mercy of the Lord. So, actually, Srila Prabhupada says that uh, in uh, Vaikuntha, the, the floors, everything is made up of touchstones. So, actually, there is no need of sweeping. Uh, it is already clean, but still, the uh, ladies in Vaikuntha, they are uh, engaged in uh, cleaning. Uh, so, as in Dhamma we hear, uh, Lakshmi, Sahasra, Satasam, Brahma, Sevya, Manam. So they are all uh, uh, engaged in serving the Lord. And then we have a uh, description of uh, the goddess of fortune worshipping the Lord in their own garden. They, all the uh, uh, ladies in Vaikuntha, they are worshipping the Lord in their own gardens by Tulsi leaves. And their face appears when they uh, are doing service they are able to see their face reflection in the water and uh, by that they, their face appears more beautiful because of the Supreme Lord kissing their faces. Because that, what is that, the last part? Their face appears more beautiful because the Supreme Lord kisses their face. Um, I still didn't get it. Their face appears more beautiful because? Of the Lord's kissing their faces. Of the Lord kissing their faces. Yes, yes, Maharaj. Oh. Okay. Thank you very much for that. All right. We have group number three. Hare Krishna. So I'm representing the group, group number three. So the points we collected is, first is like how uh, Vaikuntha planets are full of variegatedness. It's like, uh, like how a lot of impersonalists, they think that there is no variety in spiritual world. Everything is one. So that's not true. The spiritual world is full of varieties. Another thing also like, uh, Everything is fresh, new, and transcendental. Like to explain, like how the doorkeepers of the Vaikuntha planet, they are, uh, they always have this fresh, fresh garland around their legs, which, uh, which attracts the bees and other uh, swans. 
and then there is self eliminated uh, airplanes and which is uh, mainly and the pilots are mainly the great devotees of the lord and uh, also uh, like how a lot of them gods they wanted to have a human body so that they can uh, get, they can perfect and they can uh, go back to spiritual world they can perfect their life and uh, uh, in discussion about vaikuntha planets are as good as uh, being there it's like uh, like how by discussing about like uh, because like the devotions are by discussing about vaikuntha planet one can uh, go to go there not just by that but one of the process we can discuss about the spiritual world and by like by discussing about vaikuntha planet is as good as being there and also vaikuntha planet is full of opulences but still the people there are not distracted their center is to please krishna and uh, there is no scarcity of anything in vaikuntha planet like uh, not just scarcity but also uh, things are more valuable compared to the material world and because they are spiritual they are blissful and uh, eternal and bliss uh, full of eternal and bliss so uh yeah, set the points on the table can you tell us a little more about this that uh the human life and why the demigods want to get human life uh, so that they can uh, uh perfect uh, their so that they can perf perfect their life because obviously maybe because the demigod life the life span is bigger compared to human life the life span is shorter So what's the benefit So they can uh, get in, um, they can go back to god in fast like uh, like uh, easily compared to being demigod body of demigod Well how do the demigods go back to godhead They can go back to god once their life span is finished When is very very long. Wh when does the demigod's life span finish Yeah It's like uh, Like for example, Brahma's lifespan is like, uh, uh, like, like four, like four so thousand cycle of the Chatur Yuga. So that is one day, and there is a hundred day, a hundred, a hundred years of Brahma he, he has to pass. So it's a huge lifespan. The Vishal has a huge lifespan. Okay, but the human being, they can go back to Godhead in this so life. Yeah, they can move back. That is, if they practice it uh, uh, sincerely and seriously. Hmm. If I can add in this, of Purva Nila Chandrashree Maharaj, which he said, said uh, that. the when once they get human body they get, they um, attain transcendental knowledge and they perfect uh, religion they have religious perfection and therefore uh, they can actually go back to godhead by practicing devotional service that is why they want because they have so much opulence in vaikuntha it is sometimes when we have too many things we forget to do devotional service so it is easy to come to this uh, material world because this is full of misery and when they come here with their austerity and their perfection in religiosity they actually can go back much more faster our life span is also small so they can seriously practice devotional service and then go back to godhead okay And what about when we enter into Vaikuntha? Then, then they are already they have learned they have already perfected their life. So in Vaikuntha, the whole uh, can you tell us about whole, can you tell us about the entrance into Vaikuntha? Do we have to go through immigration there? Immigration, Jai Vijay, no Jai Vijay is. Uh, 
we don't go i don't know jai i don't think that is our entrance but prabhupad will give us back entrance back door that is different <laughs> <laughs> but um, once we go there uh, we are already perfected human beings that is why we are getting the entry there and then we can uh, continue our devotional service and continue to serve krishna uh, uh, narayan uh, wherever we are depending on that uh, and then we can continue serving so what happened to the four kumars when they entered vaikuntha oh they were stopped by uh, jai vijay where because in the vaikuntha doorway which doorway seventh 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 gate yeah the seventh gate right so they had to go through a number of gates they had to go through all these door gate entrances to get into the large residence to actually get into the large residence they had to go through these different doorways and when they came to the seventh gate then what happened who was there jay vijay he oh, they stopped him because they look like kids and what did jay uh, what did jay and vijay look like they look like vaikuntha vasi with four hands like narayan himself anything like what about their age they don't uh, they said uh, it said uh, uh, everyone is of same age <laughs> right they're, they're, young. they're all of the same age right that's the point right that they're, they're all of the same age <laughs> sometimes you know sometimes reporters used to ask prabhupad how old are you and what would prabhupad say the same age as you yes prabhupad would reply like that he would say i'm the same age as you what did prabhupad mean in vaikuntha everyone the same age in spiritual world well there's a deeper meaning to that prabhupad was here in the, on the on the mortal world on the physic, on this material world because so yeah is it that the soul is eternal so yes that we're not the body we're souls so prabhupad was pointing out to the the questioner that you're not the body you're a soul and i'm also a soul and our souls are all eternal we're the same age right I like the one prophet says that the death rate is the same everywhere 100%. Yeah. <laughs> well. Okay, the seventh gate, two shining shining beings of the same age armed with maces and adorned with most valuable jewelry, earrings, diamonds, helmets, garments, etc. So this is this is Vaikuntha this you can see the opulence of vaikuntha mm -hmm. and then text 28 the two doormen were garlanded with fresh flowers which attracted bee intoxicated bees placed around their necks and between their four blue arms from their arched eyebrows discontented nostrils and reddish eyes they appeared somewhat agitated why were they agitated what was going on and this poor kumaras they came uh, naked yes right the four kumaras were coming and what happened what did the two doorkeepers think How did these uh, beings come here in the spiritual world? Yes. Let's go on. Read text twenty-nine. Someone can read. The great sages, headed by Sanaka, had open doors everywhere. They had no idea of ours and theirs. With open minds, they entered the seventh door out of their own will, just as they had passed through the six other doors. which were made of gold and diamonds yes gold and diamonds 
this Vaikuntha, Vaikuntha is going to be opulent. So everything's made of the, the best, very best, most valuable gems and jewels and minerals. So they pass through the doors uh, because they're children. So children can generally move easily without much restriction. They're not going to get troubles so easily. Little children, people will let them run around. Okay, go ahead, text number 30. The four boys, say this, who had nothing to cover their bodies but the atmosphere, looked only five years old. Even though they were old, the oldest of all living creatures and had realized the truth of the self. But when the porters who happened to possess a, a disposition quite unpalatable to the Lord saw the sages, they blocked their way with their staffs, despising their glories, although the sages did not deserve such treatment at their hands. Mm. <laughs> so, the four Kumaras got blocked. Little boys, five years old, but actually they're not, they're the oldest. And the, the two doorkeepers, they're thinking, how did these kids get here? What are they doing here? So it's mentioned, the porters, meaning the two doorkeepers, they possessed a disposition quite unpalatable to the Lord. In other words, <laughs> their disposition was not very pleasing. It's not really Krishna conscious devotee. And so they saw the sages and they blocked their way, despising their glories, although the sages did not deserve such treatment. Okay, so uh, no entry to Vaikuntha for you four. Prabhupada's purport. The Lord is always anxious to serve sages like the Kumars, but in spite of knowing this fact, the doorman astonishingly and outrageously pro prohibited them from entering. Go ahead, text number 31. When the Kumaras, although by far the fittest persons, were thus forbidden entrance by the two chief doorkeepers of Sri Hari, while other divinities looked on, their eyes suddenly turned red because of anger due to their great eagerness to see their most beloved master, Sri Hari, the personality of God. Oh. All right, so we're hearing this important event about the Kumars entering into Vaikuntha and being prohibited by the two chief doorkeepers. So their eyes turned red because of anger due to their great eagerness to see. So is it allowed? They're going into Vaikuntha, they're pure devotees. Are they allowed to get angry? No, Maharaj, but uh, they are impersonalists. They were impersonalists, right, at that time. So, impersonalists are not uh, allowed to uh, meet Krishna. Hari, right? Are they allowed to get angry? No. In Vaikuntha, there is no Kunta anyways. So, everyone is without anxiety or anger. But this is Krishna's pastime, that's why. Is a pure devotee allowed to get angry? Only yes. uh, for certain reasons. Only for if someone is blaspheming uh, another devotee or Krishna, only for those reasons. Spiritual anger, but not for material. So, was Jai and Vijay, were they blaspheming anybody? No. But their reaction is uh, not appropriate because they also should understand that in Vaikuntha, anyone cannot, you know, no one can, just like that people cannot come there. So there must be some special personality who has come to their door. Well, you have, we have to be a bit cautious 
about anger. First of all, remember Lord Shiva, how many eyes did he have? Three. What do they represent? The third eye is... Oh, that is... Oh, third sun, eye is... Sun, moon and fire. Thank you, Prabhu. Yeah. Sun, the moon and fire. Right. So, here we have the four Kumars coming in. And <coughs> Prabhupada talks about sannyasis. <laughs> he says, uh, sannyasis can go anywhere. They're supposed to go anywhere. Does it mean we, a sannyasi can go anywhere and not be stopped? Of course not. If you, you know, does it mean sannyasi doesn't need a visa? Did Prabhupada need a visa to go to America? He did not. Yes, Maharaj. Did Prabhupada ever get stopped entering countries? Yes, I think so. Anybody know? Was Prabhupada prohibited from entering some countries? Which country? Russia, I think. No, he went to Russia. No, there was, oh, it was Malaysia or something. Singapore. Oh, Singapore. Singapore didn't let him in. I think it was the only place which didn't let Prabhupada in, Singapore. They have a very materialistic society and they didn't want Hare Krishna. <laughs> Even today, it's difficult there, you know, we have to be very cautious. So? In China too, Maharaj, isn't it so? I mean, they have to do it in hiding, that's what I heard. Uh, if you you can do it if you if you know some people do it that, that, that some uh, people, some swamis do enter they go you know they get permission and they get in and of course the government watch them and see what they're doing and it's up to the the, the different people how they want to do it some people they they want to do it undercover and some people go openly but China generally, they, they can allow it, they can do it, you can go there. And they do allow Buddhist monks and so on in. Anyway, in 1970, 1971 or something like that, Prabhupada wanted to go to Singapore and Singapore government had heard about Krishna consciousness and about Hare Krishna devotees and they thought, we don't want this in Singapore. So they didn't let Prabhupada in. Okay, so uh, we should understand that there is anger on the transcendental platform. And sometimes Prabhupada could get angry. And the, one time there was a Pandal program in Delhi and Prabhupada got very angry at one man. There was one young man who was challenging Prabhupada, asking, and Prabhupada got very angry at him. And some people didn't understand. And some people were complaining that, oh, Swamiji should not get angry. But anger can be used in the service of Krishna. And we see here, in the case of the four Kumaras, that they got angry. Now, why did they get angry? because they were denied the opportunity to enter into the spiritual world, to see the Lord and to do service. So for that purpose you're entitled to get angry. For people who restrict your devotional service, then you may get angry at them. That's proper use of anger. But it was necessary to obtain permission? Sorry? Necessary. It was, it, was, it was necessary to obtain permission from the Lord because they are guiding the Lord, they are the doorkeepers. Yeah, but they didn't go and ask the Lord. They didn't say, wait a minute and we'll just go and ask the Lord if you can come. They just decided on their own that you can't come. That's not right. 
they sh they could have been polite about it and said, "You please wait. We'll just go and tell the Lord you're here." But they didn't do that. Hmm. Prabhupada writes, the doorkeeper should have known that the four sages had no other business. This is text number uh, uh, 31. The four sages had no other business and therefore to restrict them from entering the palace was not apt. What was their business? The four Kumaras, they wanted to see the Lord. He is, the Lord is the greatest well-wishing friend of everyone and the four Kumaras wanted to see him. The doorkeeper should have known that. But they restricted them. And then it, Prabhupada then talks about anger. He, said, he says, when the sages were forbidden to see their most beloved personality of Godhead, then the anger suddenly appeared. The younger brother of desire is anger. If one's desire is not fulfilled, the younger brother anger follows. Here we can mark that even great saintly persons like the Kumaras were also angry, but they were not angry for their personal interests. They were angry because they were forbidden to enter the palace to see the personality of Godhead. Therefore, the theory that in the perfect perfectional stage one should not have anger is not supported in this verse. Anger will continue even in the liberated stage. Right? Is it clear? There's a difference. The difference between the anger of an ordinary person and that of a liberated person. The difference is that an ordinary person becomes angry because his sense desires are not being fulfilled. Whereas a liberated person, like the four Kumars, become angry when restricted in the discharge of duties for serving the personality of Godhead. And the four Kumars, they are liberated persons. So Prabhupada said, this point is very important. Becoming liberated does not necessitate losing one's sensual activities. Sense activities continue even in the liberated stage. Okay, so this is an important part, an important point in this chapter. The sage said, when these two persons who have developed such a <coughs> discordant, discordant mentality that even they are posted in the service of the Lord in the highest position and are expected to have developed the same qualities as the Lord. How are these two persons living in Vaikuntha? Where is the possibility of an enemy's coming into the kingdom of God? The personality of Godhead has no enemy. Who could be, who could be envious of him? Probably these two persons are imposters. Therefore, they suspect others to be like themselves. So this is the thinking of the four Kumaras. They think that these two gate, the two gatekeepers are imposters. 
Okay, enough. Yeah. Thank you. They're thinking the two gatekeepers are imposters. Now, engaging in the service of the Lord, they should have all good qualities. How could it happen that these two gatekeepers became like that? Prabhupada's purport, he said, in the Vaikuntha world, there is no question of enmity between the Lord and the residents. Here in the material world, the citizens may be inimical to the chief executives or heads of state, but in Vaikuntha, there is no such mentality. One is not allowed to enter Vaikuntha unless he has completely developed the good qualities. The basic principle of goodness is to accept subordination to the personality of Godhead. So the sages were surprised that the two doorkeepers checked them from entering. It may be said that a doorman's duty is to determine who should be allowed, but that is not relevant in this matter, because no one is allowed to enter Vaikuntha unless he has developed a hundred percent mentality of service to Krishna. So, you know, they should have understood that, that there's no possibility of any imposters coming there into Vaikuntha. So the Kumaras, they decided that the only reason for the doorman stopping them, the doorman were imposters. Therefore, <laughs> uh, in Vaikuntha, going ahead, next verse, 33, in Vaikuntha there is complete harmony between the residents and the Lord. Just as there is complete harmony within space between the big and the small sky. Why then, is there, why then is there a seed of fear in this field of harmony? These two persons are dressed like inhabitants of Vaikuntha, but wherefrom can their disharmony come into existence? So this is uh, another important feature of this chapter, talking about the nature of the Vaikuntha atmosphere, that there's perfect harmony there. Even though there may be different departments, there has to be this harmony. And Prabhupada talks about different offices in the government. All living entities who are residents of the material universes are considered to be more or less criminals because they do not wish to abide by the order of the Lord or they are against the harmonious activities of God's will. This is the problem. This is why we're here in the material world. We are not able to harmonize ourselves with the spiritual world. So we come into this place and we suffer. Prabhupada said, thus, when, whenever there is a discrepancy in that harmony, immediately the living entity is entrapped by maya or illusion. In the Vaikuntha world, there is no disharmony between the Lord and the residents. Therefore, God's creation in the Vaikuntha world is perfect. There is no cause of fear. It's such a completely harmonious unit that there is no possibility of enmity. Everything there is absolute, just as there are many psychological con connections with the body. Yet they work in one order for the satisfaction of the stomach. 
just as in a machine, there are hundreds and thousands of parts, but they run in harmony to fulfill the function of the machine. In the Vaikuntha planets, the Lord is perfect and the inhabitants also perfect in their service to the Lord. And then Prabhupada speaks about the Mayavadi interpretation of this harmony. Okay. Maharaj, I wanted to clarify one point. Yes. Uh, Maharaj, the Kumaras are angry, so they were not under the influence of any material modes when they were angry. They were in pure goodness. Yes. In pure goodness, they were angry. Yes. Is that so, Maharaj? Yeah, they're utilizing their anger for their devotional service in the service of Krishna because they want to do their service for Krishna. Right? Yes, Mother. Mother, I understood that when one a person is angry, he loses control over himself and he is swept away by that anger. So is this angry anger different from the anger of a person in material world, the anger of a liberated person? Yes. I, I, somebody like the four Kumaras, they can use anger in the service of Krishna. Yes, Maharaj. So they, they, are, they can control their anger. At the very next moment they can just control it. Yes, right. We are controlled by the anger. Yes, yes. So anger can be used by one who is the master of their mind and senses. Yes, Lord. Okay, is it clear? Yes, Lord. Okay, now we're talking about harmony. And this important purport, text number 33, Prabhupada writes, Harmony or disharmony is realized because of the law and order of a particular place. Religion is the law and order of the Supreme Lord. In the Srimad Bhagavad Gita, we find that religion means devotional service or Krishna consciousness. Then Prabhupada says, Krishna says, give up all religion and simply surrender unto me. This is religion. When one is fully conscious, Krishna is the supreme, then one will act accordingly. Anything that goes against this principle is not religion. In the spiritual world, this religious principle is maintained in harmony. And therefore, that world is called Vaikuntha. If the same principles could be adopted here, then it is also Vaikuntha. And then Prabhupada talks about ISKCON. If the members of ISKCON, putting faith in Krishna as the center, live in harmony according to the order and principles of Bhagavad Gita, then they are living in Vaikuntha, not in this material world. Jai, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Right? Coming back to the PowerPoint, here we have the four Kumaras. That's text 29. Okay, they came to the seventh door and they couldn't get in. Jai and Vijay stopped them. Their eyes suddenly became red due to anger to see their most beloved master the personality of Godhead. And then we quote, anger can continue even in the liberated stage. The four Kumaras thought the two doorkeepers to be imposters. Their behavior was not in harmony with the Vaikuntha mood. They, since they find duality in the Vaikuntha life, they are contaminated. They should be removed from this place and put in the material world. 
And here's Prabhupada's quote about Vaikuntha Harmony. Members of ISKCON put faith in Krishna as the center, live in harmony according to the principles of Bhagavad Gita. Then they are living in Vaikuntha, not in the material world. So question is, how can we apply this principle to help us deal with this harmony amongst devotees in ISKCON? Definitely we have disharmony in ISKCON, right? Maharaj, before this I have one question. <laughs> oh. can, I, can I ask you? Well, if you're going to go back to some other topic. Not an other topic, in the same uh, topic itself. Okay. So in... First, we ha I have to understand about the anger. Uh, that is the reason why I'm asking. Is because uh, there is another way of understanding when we are having a situation where, in spite of I'm not doing anything, you know, like I want something, but not for my sense pleasure. Even for Krishna's service, um, at that time, if that thing doesn't happen. We are told that we should be thinking that this is Krishna's will. That means I have to practice more devotional service. I have to let it in Krishna's hand and not be angry on that situation. Whereas here it is said that when it is service for Krishna, I am allowed to be angry. So how can I see this? Well, like we said, anger can be used if you can con control the anger, if you are the master of your mind and senses, then you're, you can use the anger in Krishna's service. But if you can't, then don't try. Because we know ang anger is a three, what, they're one of, it's one of three gates to hell. We're supposed to avoid these things. So you have to have good justification and you have to be able to apply your anger in the proper way. It can't just be something you think is right. It must be approved by the general body of devotees or by the family. Not just only you. Srila Prabhupada, sometimes we get angry if a dis disciple had a failure or a mistake. But after he chastised him, immediately all the anger was gone. Yes. So, how can we apply this principle to help us deal with disharmony amongst devotees? What is the principle? Putting faith in Krishna as the center. Live in harmony according to the order and principles of Bhagavad Gita. Right? ISKCON has taken this very seriously. They've created ISKCON Resolve to work out differences between devotees and they have even a course on how to negotiate and work to resolve problems. <laughs> yes. Recently we were involved with one problem and the other party refused to go to ISKCON Resolve. <laughs> what do you do, you know? You know, it was proposed we go to ISKCON Resolve and settle the issue, but the other party refused. No, <laughs> we're right. <laughs> Very interesting.
So it, this harmony certainly is a problem amongst devotees. How can we deal with this disharmony? Well, we want to apply, try to apply better in, in a more, uh, in a more uh, purer manner, the principles of Bhagavad Gita. According to the order and principles of Bhagavad Gita and put faith in Krishna as the centre. These are the challenges which we face. We're thinking, I'm the centre. I want to be the centre. Why Krishna is always in the centre? <laughs> I want to be the centre. I'm right. So we have to be willing to have faith in Krishna and in the principles of Bhagavad Gita. We should follow the, these teachings. So disharmony, yeah, it, it's there. It enters into our society. We allow Kali, the influence of the age of Kali, argument and quarrel, it, it comes in our midst and create so much disharmony. What is, what is a, a little issue, a, a small molehill becomes a great mountain. We make, we make the little disputes into something very big. So disharmony amongst devotees, we, def, we defeat our purpose of the Krishna Consciousness Movement when we don't work together in harmony with each other. It's very important. It's essential. Prabhupada taught, taught us that your love for me will be shown. How? You call. How much you cooperate when? among yourself? Yes, after I am gone, how much you cooperate together. So, very important, working together. Raj, in this connection, there was a nice plus one devotee was making. He said, he was talking about the false ego. He said that if we just see the concept of the false ego and we apply it to ourselves, that's how we get hypocrisy. And when you have false ego with yourself and with another person, that's how you get uh, quarrel. So that's how this whole Kali Yuga is essentially a problem of the false ego, hence quarrel and hypocrisy. I thought it was an interesting way to look at it. Okay, yeah. The false ego, the ahunka. We definitely have to be very cautious of that. Okay, let's go ahead with this chapter. We're... Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj. Uh, so actually, why is why in Vaikunta why is Jai Vijay there? Actually, I mean, really, I need to understand because uh, which Kumaras what they're saying is also true because they they did it does not require there should not be any gatekeeper because everyone is anyways pure devotee. Well. Everyone has to have some service. Just like the, the Krishna's wives are dusting the palace in Dwarka, there's no dust, but still they're cleaning the palace because they want to be engaged in service. So they were given that service to be the, the doorkeepers on Vaikuntha. Okay, go ahead, text 34. Someone read. Therefore, let us consider how these two contaminated persons should be punished. The punishment should be apt, for thus benefit can eventually be bestowed upon them. Since they find duality in the existence of Vaikuntha life, they are contaminated and should be removed from this place 
to the natural world where the living entities have three kinds of enemies. Mm. What are the three kinds of enemies? Kama, Krodha, Loha. Yes, right. So they are in this... <laughs> this is the judgment of the four Kumaras. Let them go to the material world. And Prabhupada talks about the material world is a place where all the criminals are. <laughs> We're all criminals ourselves. And we have our prison uniform in the form of the material body. And we're in shackles. And our shackles are the three modes of nature. So, how to get out of this condition? And Prabhupada ends his purport. Training in Krishna consciousness will help one be promoted to Vaikuntha. We need to be trained in Krishna consciousness. So this is the idea. When we get that training, then we can enter into... So the training comes about by hearing and chanting. Go ahead, text 35. Someone read? When the uh, doormen of Vaikuntha Loka, who were certainly devotees of the Lord, found that they were going to be cursed. Yeah. We're going to be cursed by the Brahmanas. They at once became very much afraid and fell down at the feet of the Brahmanas in great anxiety. For a Brahmana's curse cannot be counteracted by any kind of weapon. So Jain Vijay regretted their action. They're worried about the curse of the Brahmanas, the four Kumaras. They'd made a mistake and they're, they're aware that oh, this is a bit serious, become a bit serious. And Prabhupada talks about offences, and the greatest offence, to offend a devotee. So because, it, because they offended a devotee, that's put them into great trouble, big problem. Right? Can you think of some examples, other people who offended devotees, they got big problems? Durvasa Muni. Who? Durvasa Muni, yes. Who else? Maharajitran. Maharajitra Ketu also. Uh, he offended Lord Shiva and Pada. Okay. Chitra Ketu offended Lord Shiva, yeah. Hiranakashipu also. Prahlad Maharaj. Okay. And Dakya also uh, offended uh, Lord Shiva. Okay, Daksha also offended Lord Shiva. Yes, he was offensive, Daksha. Right? Yes, Mr. Nair offended Sila Prabhupada. <laughs> yes, right. He did, didn't he? Good. In Mahabharat uh, Duryodhan. In Mahabharat, who? Du Duryodhan, Duryodhan. Oh, Duryodhan. Oh. Draupadi and the Pandavas. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, I'd like to anybody like to like to read the next verse. Text number thirty six. 
After being cursed by the sages, the doom man said, It is quite apt that you have punished us for neglecting to respect sages like you. But we pray that due to your compassion at our repentance, the illusion of forgetting the Supreme Personality of Godhead will not come upon us as we go progressively downwards. Oh, thank you. So the, this is the reply. This is how Jai and Vijay respond. And they accept they're guilty. And okay, and they say, it's, it's good you punished us because we neglected to give you proper respect. But still they, they, they ask, just, we just pray that we won't forget Krishna. So that's the important thing. That even if we're going to go down, we don't want to forget the Supreme Lord. So that's our most important principle in Krishna consciousness, right? One regulation over all others. Always remember Krishna, never forget him. So, then at that time, at that very moment, takes 37, the Lord, Padmanabha, known as Padmanabha because the Lord is grown from his navel, who is the delight of the righteous, learned about the, learned about the insult offered by his own servants to the saints. Accompanied by his spouse, he went to the spot of these very, uh, of these, he went to the spot on these very feet sought by recluses and great sages. <laughs> and so Lord Padmanabha, of course, he's omniscient and he knows what's happening. He knows about this quarrel between the sages and the doorman. And he, he's coming. He's going to help to uh, straighten the thing out, the issue out. The sages, headed by Sonakarishi, saw that the personality of Godhead Vishnu, who was formerly visible only within their hearts in ecstatic trance, had now actually become visible to their eyes as he came forward accompanied by his own associates, bearing all paraphernalia, such as an umbrella, chamara fan, the white bunches of hair moved very gently, like two swans, due to their favourable breeze. Pearls garlanded the umbrella, also moved, like drops of nectar falling from the white full moon, or ice melting due to a gust of wind. Okay, so this very detailed description of the Lord coming there. And it's described how the four Kumaras they were previously used, how did they used to see the Lord? How were they accustomed to seeing the Lord? As a Brahman. Huh? What method did they use to see the Lord when they were seeing the Lord previously, before coming to Vaikuntha? By Jnana Yoga, he, he used to perceive Lord. Yeah, they were particularly doing actually a stanga yoga, right? They were meditating. They were the, the, the four Kumaras, their place is Tapaloka. It's one of the four planets at the top of the universe. So they were residing there. And They were residing there and, and the Lord came there. Oh, well, they would meditate on the Lord in their hearts, right? The Astanga yogis, they see the Lord as the Paramatma, they meditate on him. But now they've come to, the, to Vaikuntha and they're able, they're able to actually see the Lord. Right. 
Maras, they were impersonalists. Yes. And uh, the destination of impersonalists is to emerge in the effulgence of the Lord. Although that is that situation in the Vaikuntha world, still they will emerge into the effulgence. They did not uh, associate with any devotee. How did they? Uh, how did they acquire the right to go to the Vaikuntha planet? Well, they are the four Kumaras. They are the sons of Brahma, and they have that power that they can travel into the spiritual world, just like Durvasa Muni. He could also travel. He went when when he was chased by the Surasan Chakra. He entered into the spiritual world also, and he went to see Lord Narayan, and he asked Lord Narayan to save him from the Surasan Chakra. And what did Lord Narayan say? I cannot say you. Yes. But Durvasa could go there. Now Durvasa wasn't a devotee, but by his yoga powers, he could go there. He couldn't stay there. So that's the point. The four Kumars could go there because they were great yogis. They were meditating on the Lord in their heart and they decided to travel. They would, they would travel and sometimes they traveled to the spiritual world. So on this particular occasion, they got stopped by Jain Vijay and now Lord Padmanabha has come to see them. And the, this beautiful description about Lord Padmanabha, let's describe text 39. We'll just go on, you can read it yourself. And go on to text number 40. Someone can read text 40. Oh, that's also, that's also a description, right? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, let's go ahead, text 41. What's happening? More, more description? Yeah? Yeah, it's also more descriptions, right? Very detailed descriptions of the Lord for our meditation. Okay, you can read text 42. The exquisite beauty of Narayana, being many times magnified by the intelligence of his devotees, was so attractive that it defeated the pride of the goddess of fortune in being the most beautiful. My dear demigods, the Lord who thus manifests himself is worshipable by me, by Lord Shiva and by all of you. The sages regarded him with unsated eyes and joyously bowed their heads at his lotus feet. Okay, so we're seeing the respect and the on veneration. This is Vaikuntha, this is a mood of Vaikuntha, you see. And then we come to this very wonderful verse, which is one of the memorization verses for this section, text number 43. Okay, we, we can chant the verse together. Let's read the, chant the Sanskrit. Tashya Ravinda Nayanashya Padaravinda Kanjau Kamishra Talasi Makaranda Vayu. Yes? Yes, go ahead. Antargata Savirarena Sukara Talisam Sangshoba Maksharam Jitam Okay, so translation. When the breeze carrying the aroma of Tulsi leaves from the toes of the lotus feet of the personality of Godhead entered the nostrils of those sages, they experienced a change both in body and in mind, even though they were attached to the impersonal Brahman understanding. All right, so we're seeing this is the this is the change, this is the transformation in the four Kumaras, that they went there to the spiritual world and they got influenced. They smelt the aroma of the toxic leaves and the saffron, 
which were placed on the lotus feet of the Lord. It entered their nostrils. They experienced a change in their body and in their mind. Though they were attached to the impersonal Brahma, they were Brahmaganis. They were not Mayavadis. They were Brahmaganis. So they can become devotees. And they, they did. They gave up their impersonalism. Going ahead, text 44. Uh, said, after seeing the face of the Lord, the sages were fully satisfied and they wanted to see him further. They looked upon the nails of his lotus feet, which resembled rubies. Thus they viewed the Lord's transcendental body again and again, so they finally achieved meditation on the Lord's personal feature. They'd heard about it before from Lord Brahma. Now they're actually seeing it. They'd heard it from, the, from their father, their father's Brahma. They'd heard about the Lord, but, you know, they were more inclined to Brahman. But when they actually saw the Lord, then they thought about it more. So this is the form of the Lord which is meditated upon by the followers of the yoga process. And it is pleasing to the yogis in meditation. It is not imaginary, but factual, as proved by great yogis. The Lord is full in eight kinds of achievement. But for others, these achievements are not possible in full perfection. I was just talking today with a devotee and he was telling me how this one devotee came, well, this one man came here to Mayapur. His brother actually had an apartment here in Mayapur and he came to stay in his apartment for some reason. But the brother initially was, you know, he wasn't interested in Krishna consciousness. He was like an atheist. But still, he, he somehow he came to Mayapur. And after being in Mayapur for some time, he, start, he just changed, become like a devotee. Just the atmosphere, just the environment of Krishna consciousness has brought about a change in his consciousness. Now, here we see the four Kumaras. It came about immediately. Of course, the Lord was personally in their presence and they could understand something very powerful by the presence of the Lord. So the change in the body and in the mind. Very wonderful. Okay. Text 49. We hear the Kumaras are speaking. Our dear Lord, you are not manifest to rascals, even though you are seated within the heart of everyone. But as far as we are concerned, we see you face to face, although you are unlimited. The statements we have heard about you from our father, Brahma, through the ears have now been actually realized by your kind appearance. So you see, Lord Brahma, as her father, he told them about the Lord. But they were just thinking, oh no, we just like Brahman, we just want to meditate on the Brahman. We get people like that, you know, their family may be devotees, but they think, oh no, I just want to be an impersonalist. Even Advaita Acharya, he had six sons, only three were devotees. The other three were smarter Brahmins. So <laughs> some people follow the father and some don't. Not everybody takes the father so seriously that they will embrace the opinions of their father. And so then the four Kumaras go on to glorify the Lord, to accept him as the supreme absolute truth, and they praise him. We know you are the Supreme Absolute Truth, the Personality of Godhead who manifests a transcendental form in the uncontaminated mode of pure goodness. 
Thus transcendental eternal form of your personality can be understood only by your mercy through unflinching devotional service by great sages whose hearts have been purified in the devotional way. So, <laughs> they don't make it sound too easy. You need a lot of mercy. People who are very expert and most intelligent in understanding things as they are, engage in hearing narrations of the auspicious activities and pastimes, which are worth chanting and worth hearing. Such persons do not care even for the highest material benediction, namely liberation, to say nothing of other less important benedictions like the material happiness of the heavenly kingdom. Then text 49. O Lord, we pray that you let us be born in any hellish condition of life just as long as our hearts and minds are always engaged in the service of your lotus feet. Our words are made beautiful by speaking of your activities. Just as Tulsi leaves are beautified when offered unto, unto your lotus feet, and as long as our ears are always filled with the chanting of your transcendental qualities. So this is a prayer of the four Kumaras. We therefore offer our respectful obeisances unto your eternal form, which you have so kindly manifested before us. Your supreme eternal form cannot be seen by unfortunate, less intelligent persons, but we are so much satisfied in our mind and vision to see it. So this is the good fortune of the four Kumaras. They had that opportunity to see the Lord. Just coming back to the PowerPoint again, a little bit about Vaikuntha Harmony. The, the importance of maintaining harmony is Vaikuntha. If the same principles can be applied here, wholly or partially, then it is also Vaikuntha. So, cooperation, very important. Somehow, working together, it takes two people to argue. Sometimes we just have to give in, we just have to let other people, okay, okay, do it your way, all right. I'll say, next slide, Lord Padmanabha is appearing and displays himself to the four Kumaras. Here's the verse, Tashyaravinda, right? And then, okay, the objectives, what we covered tonight, the overview of chapter 15. Features of the Vaikuntha planets, right? What are some features of the Vaikuntha planets? Someone, give me one. Chintamani, made of Chintamani jewels, trees. Okay, and now they were very opulent, right? A lot of opulence. Yes? Free of anxiety. Free of any anxiety. Without anxiety, free of anxiety. Oh, yes, very good. Yes. Beautiful features. Beautiful features. Yeah. No, no sense gratification. Well, I don't know about that. No material sense gratification. Yes. Yeah. They, they certainly have sense gratification, superior sense gratification. What is their sense gratification? 
Yeah, if you are uh, the the Sanskrit the, in Vaikuntha, the only thing is like everyone is trying to satisfy Lord, not their own senses. Yes, right. That, and how right. how do they satisfy the Lord? What are they doing? Remember, they were traveling in the airplanes, and their wives are very beautiful, but they're not lusty after their wives. And why? They're glorifying the Lord. Yes, they're glorifying, they're hearing and reciting the glories of the Lord. All right. Then the relevance for preaching of the Kumaras changing from impersonal to personal. Yes, this is a, an important example of the four Kumaras. They were initially impersonalists, Brahmagyanis, but they gave up that and became personal after seeing the form of the Lord, after smelling the aroma of the tulsi leaves from his own lotus feet. And we spoke about this harmony and spiritual harmony and how it's really vital for our ISKCON society. We really need this harmony. Okay, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Are there any questions? Anybody has any questions or comments tonight? Mm, yes, Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, uh, in Vekuntha, uh, do the uh, the residents have kids also? Or are they eternal? I don't know. Uh, it's puzzling. I'm not very sure. I did read in the Brihad Bhagavatamrita that it describes when Gop Kumar was going into Vaikuntha, there were families there. But when we read this part of the Bhagavatam, it seems to indicate everyone's of the same age. And there's no old age and everyone's of the same age. At least Jai and Vijay were the same age. And there's no old age and there's no disease. And so, are there children there? <laughs> the, uh, it certainly seemed like that when I read Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, but I, I, you don't, we don't get much information about it there in Srimad Bhagavatam. Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. Yes, Maharaj. One more question, Maharaj. Uh, may I ask? Yes. I just want me to uh, know your viewpoint, Maharaj, about this uh, invasion of Ukraine by the Putin. <laughs> so, can we consider Putin to be an Atatai or is he doing some offense because there are, there are many devotees also in Ukraine or is he correct or not? I just wanted to know your view. Well, certainly we, very, we really worry about the devotees because there's, it's a wonderful country. You know, I don't go there myself, but I know some of the devotees who preach there. Well, many senior devotees, some of our best preachers go there because it's a very good field for preaching Krishna consciousness. And there are many, many devotees there. The people are very good candidates for devotional service. And they do wonderful kirtans and so on. So, uh, we really pray for the devotees there in Ukraine, you know. And we certainly don't approve of what's going on today in the way of bombing and everything. All this fighting and killing, it's really horrible. It's Cali. It's really unfortunate. And we really hope that will end very soon. Because I, I know the devotees are living there in very difficult conditions. Many of them have taken shelter in the basement of the temple. It's very cold still, it's below zero, and they have no water, no electricity, they have, I don't know how much food they have left, I don't know how long they will survive. It's really terrible. We really pray for their, for their relief, that Krishna will arrange something. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Anyone? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. 31st uh, uh, in the last uh, 
upper code, last upper code, last uh, lines. Uh, when becoming liberated, the same uh, Let's see it using consensual activities. And since uh, it is they take in uh, connection with Krishna, like the uh, proper road. And I heard that uh, Prabhupada would feel like cold and hot seasons when he travel different countries. Is that right? Probably very difficult to hear you. You've got so much background noise there. Yeah. One second. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Now Maharaj. Oh, oh. Here in the last last part of the thirty first slot of Maharaj. Last Which paragraph. Text number fifty. Thirty first Maharaj. Oh, thirty one. Okay, go, yes, go back to 31. Huh? Okay. Um, last purport, the last paragraph, Maharaj. Okay, last paragraph, yeah. Uh, becoming liberated does not initiate losing one's sensual activities. Since uh, sense activities continue even in the liberated state, uh, the difference is, however, the sense activities in liberated uh, are accepted only in connection with Krishna consciousness. Okay. Uh, and I have that uh, Prabhupada would feel cold weather when he travel different countries and heart also. Uh, is there any connection, Maharaj? Prabhupada what? When he travelled in different countries? He would feel uh, hot and cold conditions uh, when, uh, when uh, he wear, like uh, when it is very cold, he, he would wear like warm clothes. Yes. Is there any connection, Maharaj? Uh, he, we know that Prabhupada is liberated. And still, uh, he would feel like cold and that. Well, we have to understand what is the definition of liberation. Liberation means using the body, mind and words in the service of Krishna. Liberation doesn't mean that we, have to, we can neglect the body. We have a body, we have a material body, we have to protect it, we have to maintain it. And so similar, Prabhupada would go in a cold country, he would wear warmer clothing to protect himself from the cold. Because if he doesn't do that, then his body is going to become sick and it will, it will influence his devotional service. When he becomes sick, he won't be able to do it writing and won't be able to do preaching, it will affect his service. So he maintains his body by covering it properly with woolen cloth and so on and sweaters to protect himself from the different weather conditions. That doesn't mean he's not liberated. Liberation means one who uses his body in the service of Krishna. Then he says, Ihayasya hare dasye karmana manasagira nikilaspapiya vastastu jivan mukta sa uchate. The liberated soul, jivan mukta, is one who uses his body, mind and words in the service of Lord Krishna. That is the liberated soul. Don't think Yes, because you don't wear cold, uh, cover up your body in the cold weather, you must be liberated. No. You have to take care of the material body. It's given to us by Krishna. We use it for Krishna's service. You have to maintain it. You have to protect it. If you get sick, you have to, you have to treat it with medicine and so on. Just because you're liberated doesn't mean you won't get sick. 
So you have to understand these things properly. All right, Prabhu? Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Yes, anybody else has a question? Okay, we'll stop here then tonight. We'll meet you next weekend. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada ki. Gorbhakta Vrinda ki. Hare Bo.